Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Lily. As you're probably very aware by now, I have been reading the Harry Potter series for the very first time recently. And I just finished Goblet of Fire. Not gonna lie, I was kind of scared of this one. So just some background knowledge on how much I actually knew about Goblet of Fire before reading the book, um, which really isn't that much. But I did watch the movie one time years and years ago. So I had a really vague idea of what goes down in this book. Really, the only things I remembered were there was a Triwizard Tournament, Harry's name gets called out of the Goblet of Fire. I knew the three challenges were something to do with dragons, being underwater, and a maze. If you remember my Philosopher's Stone video, I said that someone's secretly a shark. <laughs> Victor Crumb transfiguring himself into a shark to get past that challenge. I had no fucking clue what I was talking about and I was like 300% wrong. It's Victor Crumb transfiguring himself and I laughed so hard when I got to that part. That's pretty much everything I knew about Goblet of Fire going into it. By the way, if you haven't read Harry Potter either, just don't watch these videos, man. You're gonna get spoiled. There's no spoiler warning. I'm just gonna spoil. Read the books first, then watch my video. Cool. Um, but yes, the death at the end so that's pretty much what I knew about it. I can tell this series is gonna take a turn. I feel like this book is probably that turning point. After reading the ending, I feel like the next books are just gonna get really political and really focus more on like the Ministry of Magic probably being a little bit corrupt. Got a bit of a bad vibe from Fudge at the end, you know what I mean? With the whole destroying all the evidence they had kind of vibe. Even in this book, the vibe was completely different to the first three. One thing, well, there's a lot of things I liked about this book, but one of the things in particular was, I guess you could say, the extended world building. Well, there's a bigger focus on the ministry, first of all, which is one of the things that I have been really fascinated by. I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, but the world building is my favorite part of the series. It's so well done, I just love it. In Goblet of Fire, Ron's jealousy of Harry is quite, uh, prevalent. But the thing is, it's like understandable. This kid, Ron has spent his whole life living in the shadows of his older brothers. His older brothers have all been really successful, top of their class, prefects, head boy, Quidditch captain. Ron doesn't really have his own thing. He never really gets his own moment to shine. And then he comes to school and then his best friend at school, Harry, is the boy who lived famous, is really talented at Quidditch. Does all this cool shit, fights off all these cool people. Like, Harry's always in the spotlight. And then his other friend, Hermione, is top of her class, really smart. When Harry's name gets picked out of the goblet and Ron's like, salty. I don't know, I feel like it's understandable. And I think it adds a lot more depth to his character. Cause I think if a kid like that, if their whole life, they've just lived in everyone's shadows and they don't have their own sense of accomplishment with really anything. They never really measure up to the people around them. I feel like it would be quite unrealistic for them to just never snap and never hit a breaking point where they're like, fuck this, how come everyone else always gets the glory? A few other things I wanna quickly talk about, the whole Yule Ball and Harry and Ron putting off till the very last minute getting dates. And that's actually something that I, noticed a lot. Harry putting things off till the very last minute to his detriment. He puts off asking Cho and then when he actually does ask her, she's already said yes to someone else. And she would have said yes if he'd just asked her earlier. So the, I don't know, that was like a whole thing. Actually, you know what? The Yule Ball in general, I have something to say. Harry and Ron treat their dates so badly, the Patil sisters. First of all, they ask them as a last resort, which is like, Wow, okay. They get there and they don't want to dance with them. Ron especially. Ron doesn't want to dance with... Oh fuck, what was her name? The other Patil sister, not Pavati, the other one. He's sulking over Hermione and Crumb the whole time. And the, the chick's just like, are we going to dance or what? Like, be a sook on your own accord. Don't ruin another these other girls' night. Yeah, spew. That whole house elf subplot wasn't even in the movie. I was looking forward to seeing that in the movie and it just wasn't there, I'm sad. Now, one thing that I wanna fucking talk about. This just smells like a plot hole to me. You guys have been really good about explaining things in the comment section without spoiling me, so thank you for that. Um, like with Sirius and the Knife and Peter Pettigrew and also with 
how the Dursleys were sent mail. If you can shed some light on this, I'd appreciate it. But this is one thing that I noticed when reading the book and I wrote it down and everything because I was like, this doesn't make fucking sense. None of this adds up. This is about Bartamius Crouch Jr and that whole breaking out of Azkaban bullshit with the mum. This wasn't explained in the movie, so you will have had to have read the book to understand what I'm talking about or to even help me out here. Basically, Barty Crouch Jr. goes to Azkaban. The mother is dying and her dying wish, I guess, is for her son to be released out of Azkaban. What they end up doing is Mr. Crouch and his wife go to Azkaban to visit Barty Crouch Jr. And what they were gonna do is they, she was gonna take Polyjuice Potion Barty Crouch Jr. was gonna take Polyjuice Potion and they were gonna swap. Mr. Crouch and his son were gonna leave Azkaban with him looking like the mum. That was the whole genius plan. And this come, this really comes down to like Polyjuice in general, how that whole thing works. The thing was, I wasn't really sure if Polyjuice Potion full on turns you into that person, if they're sick, you become sick kind of thing. The Dementors couldn't tell and didn't notice anything because they can't see and they only sense, but they sensed one healthy person, one sick person entering Azkaban and one healthy person, one sick person leaving Azkaban. Which means when he took the potion and became his mum, he took on her sickness. So when the mum changed into him, she became healthy, wouldn't she? Right, you with me? You're understanding? <laughs> so what I don't understand is they said the way they kept it up was the mum kept taking Polyjuice Potion until she died in prison to keep up the illusion that Barty Crouch Jr. was still in Azkaban, right? But I don't understand how she could have still died in jail due to sickness. It said she lived out her dying days in Azkaban disguised as Barty Crouch Jr. so it looked like he died in jail. But why would she have died in jail if she wasn't sick anymore. Unless I'm missing something key here, I'm just saying, if she transformed into a healthy person and she stayed in that state the whole time because she kept taking Polyjuice Potion continuously, she would have been healthy and she wouldn't have been dying. So it doesn't make sense for her to die in prison due to her sickness because she wouldn't have been sick anymore. That is basically what I'm trying to say. I hope that makes sense. And if it weren't for the fact that they said it sensed a healthy person and a sick person leaving, which indicates that when you take the potion, you take on that person's illnesses as well. If it gets explained in a later book or something like that, don't spoil me, just say like it's explained later. I don't know. I feel like most normal people wouldn't look into it that deeply and I'm just like nitpicking as fuck. But yeah, that's where I'm gonna end this section. Like always, I vlogged my experience reading the book. So without further ado, I will play that all for you right now. Okay, so just started. I like this World Cup. Sometimes I just forget that it's not just like a secret society of wizards in England. Um, it's all over the world, bitch. We're global. I think in the earlier books, I thought Mr. Malfoy hated the Weasleys for some specific reason. I thought there was like history between them or something, but I think honestly now it's just simply hating the Weasleys because they associate with Muggleborn wizards. He can go off as much as he wants about pure blood being the best kind of blood, but honestly, at the end of the day, they're all each other's cousins, so. I'm just saying, there's only so many pure blood wizard families. You don't have to be a pure blood to be a great wizard. Like, look at Voldemort. Voldemort was a great wizard. He was a half blood. And you see the way Lucius Malfoy licks his ass. Hi, I'm just gonna update you on how we go. World Cup's over. The Dark Mark, someone conjured it up. What happened? Crouch's elf, M M Winky, the, the elf that was in the top box, she was sitting in the top box reserving Mr. Crouch's seat and they never even showed up. Rude. She was found in the forest with a wand directly below the dark mark. Take the wand off her and it turns out to be Harry's wand. And then they do like a test on it and they see that the last spell that it performed was creating that dark mark. You don't know whether it's Winky or not. It just kind of looks Suspicious. We're back at the burrow. Um, they're getting ready to go back to Hogwarts. Mrs. Weasley went shopping for all of their school shit while they were at the World Cup. Look, here's the stuff mum got for you in Diagon Alley. And she got some gold out of your vault for you. I'm sorry, but how the fuck did she get gold out of Harry's vault? Surely you shouldn't just be able to get gold out of anyone's vault without them being there, without them giving you permission. I feel like it should be a much harder process than just rock up at the bank. Hi, I want to access Harry Potter's vault, thanks. This Mad-Eye Moody character 
is interesting. <laughs> I like his vibe, you know? The way this guy shows up at Hogwarts is iconic. He's supposed to be the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. He just rocks up late, sits at his chair, and just pulls out a flask and starts drinking. I love his vibe. It's just like, I don't give a fuck anymore. Moody's not even staying. This is what, the fourth teacher that's left them now? I actually feel like this is gonna be a running gag with the series. Like every book, they just get a new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. So the students from the other schools, Bobatons and Durmstrang have just arrived. We're meeting them and like the meeting the headmasters and stuff. So now they're interrogating Harry in that back room. The other schools are pissed off. How come Hogwarts gets two champions and we only get one? Like that's not fair, we should get an extra champion. And Moody comes in saying, well, maybe someone's put Harry's name in there hoping he would get picked and like killed in the tournament, you know what I mean? Because it's dangerous. He's basically saying that a really powerful witch or wizard must have done it to be able to hoodwink a really powerful magic object, making the Goblet of Fire think that there's four champions that compete in the Triwizard Tournament instead of just three. That's why it was able to put out a fourth name. He's saying maybe they submitted his name under a fourth school and he'd be the only student from that school to put his name in so he'd be guaranteed to get picked. So I don't know, I don't know who would have done it. I don't know, part of me thinks it could be Moody. He just seems to know an awful lot about this. It's just happened and he's immediately come up with this like elaborate theory. He is a powerful wizard, he like used to be the top of his field I think. But then again, he's a trusted friend of Dumbledore so it doesn't really make sense like why he would Oh my god, I can't deal with all these kids just being so salty. They're all pissed off because Harry got picked. And Ron. I mean, I kind of understand Ron though. I get why everyone's pissed off, but it's just like, shut up. I feel bad for Harry, everyone's turned against him. Also, Rita Skeeter is a piece of work. The first challenge is dragons. I already knew this, obviously. But, specifically, nesting dragons. I don't remember what they had to do for it, but Hagrid said they specifically wanted nesting mothers and that they don't have to fight them they just have to get past them so i feel like it's quite obvious that what they have to do is get past the nesting mother steal an egg so ludo bagman pulls harry aside before the dragon challenge right he basically tells him that if he needs any help he's not opposed to giving harry a few pointers and harry says to him oh no nah, it's okay like i already know what i'm gonna do i've got a plan this tournament you can literally die in this tournament. If an organizer of the event was willing to give me information or tips or help or anything, I would just fucking take it. I don't even care if the help is useless. What do you mean, <laughs> nah, I'm good? I just wanna say a fat fuck off to Karkarov. Who does this bitch think they are? Giving Harry a four out of 10 when everyone else gave him a nine or a 10. Gave him a shit score because he knew if he gave him anything higher than a four, his own student, would be knocked out of first place. Can we just talk about how great Hermione is? Ron asks her to the ball as a last resort and she's like, fuck you, like I'm not a last resort, bitch, what the fuck? Turns up to the Yule Ball looking hot as fuck with Ron's idol. That is the way. One thing that I think is kind of weird, so Hagrid is a half giant and apparently that's like a big deal. I don't know, I thought it was common knowledge that Hagrid was a giant. Ron's like, what? I, I didn't know he was a half giant. Are you serious? <laughs> They're like shocked. This is so stupid. Cedric literally tells him how to open the egg. He's like, yeah, this is how you open the egg. Just take it underwater. And Harry is trying all these weird other ways. Everything except taking Cedric's advice out of spite because of Cho. Are you fucked? Oh wait, wait guys, look at this. Fuck, fuck this Rita Skeeter woman. She's made Hagrid cry. Hagrid is like completely distraught over this stupid article of hers. It's all lies anyway. Calling him a vicious giant. How dare you come for Hagrid. <laughs> Bitch, no. <laughs> I hope she dies. So Snape's a Death Eater, right? Karkaroff was one of Voldemort's followers. Snape, him and Karkaroff, Harry and Ron overheard that conversation and they call each other Severus and Igor. J.K. Rowling made a point to put them on a first name basis. They know each other like that and he was a supporter of Voldemort, like, put two and two together. Can I just talk about that whole underwater sequence? Because it was Ron, Hermione and Cho. I was under the impression for a sec the challenge was gonna make Harry pick which one of those people he was gonna save. Cause they told him like, you can only save one. And I thought they were gonna make him pick which friend he had to save. So I'm reading the Pensieve chapter. He's in Dumbledore's office right now. 
fucking around with his, I don't know, bowl of memories. It shows him some trials. He's looking back at these trials, right? And one of them, they're convicted of capturing and torturing an aura, Frank Longbottom, using the Cruciatus Curse. That's Neville's dad. You never hear about Neville's parents, he lives with his grandma. Oh my god, and with the, with the Cruciatus Curse as well. Remember that scene where Neville suggested the Cruciatus Curse in class, and then he saw it being demonstrated on that spider? It really affected him. No wonder. That's so sad, like, he would have had to see what his parents had to go through. Poor Neville. I'm up to that chapter, the third task. I thought we were okay with Crumb now. I thought he was not good, but okay. Um, and they're in the maze now, and he's used the Crucio curse on Cedric. There was like this moment where Harry and Cedric were like united for a second. Cup turned out to be a port key. I already know the big like plot twist that Cedric dies. Okay, you ready for this? <laughs> I think what is going on? Whoever put Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire fucked with the cup so that he'd end up in the graveyard and Voldemort would be there, right? I feel like it might be Ludo Bagman. This whole time, he's been trying to make sure that Harry, like, wins these challenges. He's been offering him so much help and advice so that Harry would get to the cup, Voldemort can kill him. He's working with Voldemort the whole time. I think that might be the twist on top of the twist. I'm on page 651. He's talking to the Death Eaters. They've all like apparated around him. There's six missing Death Eaters. Three of them are dead. One of them is too cowardly to return. One who has left him forever. One who remains his most faithful servant. Anyways, then it says he's at Hogwarts, that faithful servant. And it was through his efforts that our young friend arrived here tonight, talking about Harry, right? So, yeah, Bagman. I just read the Priori Incantatum chapter, and that whole chapter was a head fuck. Um, but I don't understand how Expelliarmus and Avada Kedavra being said at the same time. Their two spells connect, and then it, like, turns into a golden beam of light, and then there's, like, a weird thing that, like, you know, and then it makes dead people come out of Voldemort's wand. Voldemort must be like a Disney villain that just secretly sucks. Because how is this all-powerful wizard like Voldemort who's just been restored to his full powers and shit? How is this 14-year-old boy able to block his Avada Kedavra curse? Like, that's supposed to be the like one of the only curses without a counter curse. And how the fuck does Expelliarmus- How is Expelliarmus the counter curse for Avada Kedavra? Not only does he do that, outruns 30 Death Eaters and the Dark Lord, more like the Incompetent Lord, because how are you this bad at being a villain? I'm sorry. I'm just gonna stop reading now. I think I'm done for today. <laughs> Good morning. We're back at Hogwarts now, after that whole graveyard fiasco. I just lost my page! I'm so suspicious of everyone now. Harry's all like fucked up and delirious. Cornelius Fudge is adamant about taking him to the hospital wing, like wanting to scoot him away. So I think I'm just gonna keep this camera going like I did last time. Ow. Let's read! So he's with Moody now, and he's explaining everything to him. Wow, fuck off! Moody was the one who put his name in the goblet. That's so fucked. What the hell? I was expecting it to be Ludo Bagman because he's been so sneaky about trying to get Harry to win. Even Fudge, like Fudge was acting a little bit weird at the end. Karkaroff, like literally anyone except Moody. He's friends with Dumbledore. He's like really old friends with Dumbledore. Listen to this, he's like, oh, did he forgive the Death Eaters? I wanted to know whether he forgave the scum who never even went to look for him. He's the one that fired the dark mark in the sky at the World Cup. Was he even there? He wasn't even there. I knew it! I- oh my god, I knew it. I should have stuck with my original theory. You know how he came into the room and he, like, immediately knew? Ah, oh, they must have submitted his name under a different school. This and that, this and that, blah blah blah, and he, like, knew immediately. I was right the whole time. He was one of the people that was patrolling the maze. Oh, true, because his eye, he can see through things. He could have looked through the maze and seen them. Oh my god, you know how he, like, um, showed the class how to do the Imperius Curse? He would have put the Imperius Curse on Crumb, taking out Fleur, 
getting rid of Crumb. He told Cedric to open it underwater and he knew that he would pass it on to Harry because Harry had helped him in the past. He's just manipulated and used good people into helping Harry to alleviate suspicion that it was him. Okay, don't worry everyone, Dumbledore came. This is not Alistair Moody. You've never known Alistair Moody. The real Moody would not have removed you from my sight after what happened tonight. The moment he took you, I knew, and I followed. Bitch, there's been another blood twist! Okay, so if Alistair Moody isn't actually the last servant of Voldemort, it's still someone else. So who the fuck is it? He goes, Minerva, go down to Hagrid's house. You'll find a large black dog sitting in the pumpkin patch. Take the dog up to my office and tell him I'll be with him in a moment. Sirius is back. Okay, right now they're opening that trunk with like a million locks on it. Wow, so the real Mad-Eye Moody's locked in this fucking trunk. Okay, so this dude has kept the real Alistair Moody in this trunk, kept him there controlled by the Imperius Curse so that he can keep taking like DNA from him so that he can make Polyjuice Potion and that's what he's been drinking in his flask. He's kept this dude in this box for a year. How has he stayed alive? Crouch, body crouch. Crouch died. The sun! Oh my god! That's so weird. Oh, true. Named after our fathers. Both killed our He killed his own dad? Wow, this whole time I thought Crouch, Mr. Crouch, was just like really morally bankrupt and fucked that he'd send his own son to Azkaban. He was guilty the whole time. JK Rowling is actually so good at distracting you from the twist. Like, I didn't see that coming at all, which is honestly fucked. Like, I've seen that movie. And I thought the twist was Voldemort being there at the end and Cedric dying. I was so distracted by all these subplots like the spew movement and the Yule Ball and the tournament challenges. I was too preoccupied with these other subplots to put two and two together. You know how I thought it was ridiculous that Harry was able to counter the Avada Kedavra curse by just saying Expelliarmus. Basically, there's a thing called Priori Incantatum. You know how Harry's wand has a phoenix feather in it? And so does Voldemort's. So the wands are like brother wands, I guess. If two wands like that, that have the same uh, core feather from the same bird, try to go against each other, it won't work. That's what that beam of light was. And then when it went into Voldemort's wand, it just made it regurgitate the spells that Voldemort had done. And it turns out, how cute is this? It turns out the phoenix was Forks. Forks was the phoenix, Dumbledore's bird. I think I'm just gonna power through the end and I'll update you again once I'm done. Hi, so basically I finished the book. I didn't have my seatbelt on that whole time. I'm usually so road safe, like that's so rare for me. Basically Cornelius Fudge has Cornelius fucked everything up. He brought this Dementor into the place, right? Into the school. This Dementor kills Barty Crouch. Now they can't use him to testify in court or even as proof. Like, there's no proof that he did that now. So now there's no proof that Voldemort has risen. All thanks to Fudge. Way to go, you bloody legend. This is the first book where the ending wasn't like completely wrapped up. Everything is still kind of up in the air. Like I don't know what's gonna happen now. Rita Skeet is an animagus that turns into a beetle and that's how she was able to get all this dirt on people and like find out stories. Being an unregistered animagus is illegal and Hermione found out. Congratulations, you played yourself. Also, Ludo Bagman he ripped off the twins at the World Cup with their savings. The reason he seemed so suspicious and why he was trying to help Harry win, he was trying to earn all the money back that he lost by placing a bet that Harry would win the Triwizard Tournament. He was trying to get him to win so that he'd like get his earnings back so he could pay people back. It's so funny how like that made him look guilty. And I also think it was really sweet how Harry gave the twins his earnings his like triwizard earnings because they just lost their entire life savings and he told them to open up a joke shop. I think that's so sweet. <laughs> oh, whoops. <laughs> My poor neighbors. They hate me so much. Anyways, that's it for the vlog. We're done now. Thank you for watching, by the way, if you made it this far. If you made it this far, comment poor neighbors somewhere in your comment and I'll reply to you, okay? Because bless your heart. I'll see you in the next one. Bye. And there you go. Those are my thoughts. Until next time, have a great 
life, and I'll see you soon. Bye.